Hey everybody, it's great to see you today. Today is June 20th, and this is Living Power, your online Bible study. We're walking through the Bible in a year, and today's a fun day. Today we get to read about Jonah and the whale. If you grew up in church and went to vacation Bible school or Sunday school as a child, I'm sure you heard this story about Jonah and the whale. If it's new to you, I'm going to give you some, um, some insights to help make it a, a little bit more easy to understand. The first question that you might have, however, is is this a real story or is it just fiction and um, I would offer this to you that Jewish tradition does consider this historical historical fact and that Jesus implied that he did too in Matthew 12 and again in Luke 11 so I'm coming from it that um, from a perspective that yes this really did happen there were seven different miracles just in this one story we're going to um, touch on those and yes, God actually did bring a fish to swallow Jonah and spit him out where he wanted him to go. Jonah was a prophet of God. He lived during the time of Jeroboam II, which would have been around 793 to 753. This king was a bad king. You can read about him. Let's see, I've got a verse here. 2 Kings 14, 23 to 27. Uh, Jonah prophesied that Israel would have victory during a time when it was certainly doing wrong. And um, he prophesied that Israel would have victory in this particular war, and they did. He is, however, the only Old Testament prophet that ever ran from God. And boy, running did he do. He was from the northern kingdom, and he lived in a city that was near Nazareth. He was a contemporary of Hosea and Amos, and we're going to read a little bit about Amos tomorrow and the next day. Um, maybe he knew Assyria was going to be, in the future, Israel's destroyer, and maybe he knew that um, from Amos's predictions. Maybe the prophets got together and talked. Who knows? But he certainly didn't want to go into the land of the Assyrians and to preach um, preach God to the people, did he? He was the fifth of 12 minor prophets and Nineveh is where God told him to go. It was in the capital, um, it, well I don't think it was the capital at the time, but it was one of the largest cities in Assyria. Our text today tells us that it was going to take Jonah three days to walk through the entire city preaching the word. So we know that it was a very large city. There were five times more people in this city than in Jerusalem alone. And Nineveh actually later, for its apostasy and its wrongdoing, was actually destroyed in 612 BC. But we're not there just yet. I can tell you that Nineveh was about 500 miles away from um, where Jonah started out, so it was a big trek and a big, uh, big travel that he was being asked to take. It is helpful to understand a little bit about Assyria, to understand the book of Jonah and why Jonah simply didn't want to go there. No, Jonah probably wasn't uh, a rebellious prophet. Um, this had something to do with the Assyrians, um, so this will help us understand a little bit about why he disliked um, this um, going to Nineveh so much. Nineveh was truly a city of blood. This was how they were known. They were vicious and they worshipped gods who were vicious. They didn't know the God of the Hebrews. They worshipped a god, Ishtar, which was an Assyrian Babylonian goddess of uh, sex and war, and some of her exploits were acts of savagery. They also worshipped the god Asher, and their brutality and cruelty were legendary. So, I want to warn you, the next couple of things I'm going to say is probably not appropriate for young ears, uh, so I just want to let you know that it's just, it's just kind of gross what I'm about to tell you. The Assyrians... Um, <clears throat> were known to impale their enemies on stakes in front of towns and hang their heads on trees in the king's gardens. 
They tortured their victims, their enemies, their captives, men, women, and children by hacking off noses, ears, fingers, gouging out eyes, and even tearing off lips and the skin off of hands, and I even believe they would skin all the skin off of people. They reportedly covered the city wall with the skins of their victims. Rebellious subjects would be massacred by the hundreds, sometimes burned at the stake, and their skulls would be placed in great piles by the roadside as a warning to others. We thought crucifixions by the Romans were ugly and nasty, and now you're introduced to the Assyrians. Uh, there is a little bit more, however. I think I'll just stop there. I think you get the picture. This is, pro this is probably why Jonah did not want to go there and preach to them. Now, a couple of things I wanted to point out to you so it would help you understand the story. When Jonah preaches uh, for 40 days, well, he says that 40 days Nineveh will be destroyed. This is what he tells the people if they don't repent. He knew something about this term 40 days. 40 days is a period of testing. But it's implied, and Jonah knew this, that it's because of the way God phrased it that Jonah really knew what God was up to. If the Assyrians were to repent during this 40 days, God would relent and not bring destruction on them. Jonah knew this. So he knew that there was an out for these people. And he was upset on a number of, number of levels. One, that he had to go to these people because they were so brutal. And number two... That if they could rep if they did repent, he knew God enough that God would be merciful and would not bring judgment on them. So here he is telling them God's judgment is coming, and he knew there was a good chance that God wouldn't bring judgment on them today. So he felt like um, he was going to be maybe embarrassed, so to speak, because what he was saying wasn't going to come true. Now certainly we can associate and um, you know with Jonah and how he felt, and we can understand where he's coming from. Um, Jonah knew what he was supposed to say. He had a very close relationship with God. He knew what the 40 days meant. And um, he also knew that this was Israel's enemy. And he was a little bit self-justifying, self-rationalizing in thinking, how could these people receive forgiveness? So through the story, we see God showing him um how good mercy is. God is merciful to Jonah a number of times. He saves his life after he's thrown overboard. The fish spits him out, and he has a prayer inside the belly of the fish. Thank you, God, for saving my life. But he cannot, Jonah cannot be also thankful for the people of Assyria that God is trying to save there. So there's a bit of a double standard here. One thing I wanted to mention to you that was helpful to me um, in one of the um, resources that I was looking at in preparing for the lesson today, it talked about three days and three nights. And it explained this just a little bit. It said that here's how we can understand Jonah being three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. The Jews reckoned part of a day as a full day. So we don't have to interpret this as a 72-hour period, but we can interpret it as one 24-hour day and parts of two other days. That's probably how long Jonah was in the belly of the fish. Now, this phrase, three days and nights, is found at least two other places in the Bible that I know of. One is true when Esther fasts. She probably fasted one 24-hour day and part of two other days, and it's true of another time. Can you think of another time where you've heard of three days and three nights? Jesus, when he died on Good Friday and he rose on Sunday, it had, ta been, um, it had been talked about in other places in Scripture that he would, um, in three days, he could tear down the temple and build it up again. And, you know, I always kind of wondered, wait a minute, Friday at 3 he was crucified, but Sunday morning, that's not really three seventy three days, you know, 72 hours. So this helps me to understand how that could be true. One full day would have been Saturday, and part of a day Friday, and part of a day Sunday would have explained Jesus' 
uh, time from his crucifixion to his resurrection. So I hope that's helpful to you. Now, Jonah told the people that punishment was on the way. They responded in repentance and putting on a burlap. So God did not bring destruction on them at that time. He does later in 612 BC, but they're safe for now. And in the story of Jonah, at the end, remember the plant and the worm? Um, this was another way that God was showing him his double standard. And it showed Jonah that Jonah was upset that the plant had died. But he was not upset for the hundreds of thousands of people that almost died and perished, lost, because they didn't know the true God. And God was showing Jonah how wrong that attitude was. Now, there were seven miracles. Can you find them all in this story? First, God caused the violent storm. Second, they cast lots, the, the um, fishermen in the boat, and the lot fell on Jonah. Number three, when they threw Jonah in, the sea became calm. Number four, the fish swallowed him and transported him. And number five, spit him out on dry land. Number six, the Assyrians' change of heart certainly was a miracle. And seven, how fast the plant grew in providing shade for Jonah on land. Now, there are a couple things we don't know about the book of Jonah and a couple of things that we do know and can apply to our life. We don't know the author and the date. People suppose Jonah wrote this himself, but it's written in third person, and we just don't know when it was written. And if we did know the date, that would help us to determine the author of it. We don't know where the whale dropped him off. One commentary said it probably was Joppa. Maybe it took him right back to where he started, or maybe it dropped him off in Nineveh, the place that God was telling him to go. The third thing we don't know is what type of fish is this? Uh, some commentary said it could have been a sperm whale or a whale shark, but we're not really sure. Certainly big enough to hold a man in his belly for that amount of time. Here's what we do know. The book stresses the universal power of God over nature. God can cause all of these miracles. And I oftentimes find it so interesting that, you know, the, the earth and nature and the animals that God created follow his orders explicitly. He never has any trouble getting a tree to do what, he, what it's supposed to do or an animal to do what it's supposed to do. They always follow the word of the Lord. It's the pinnacle of creation. It's us, men and women, who are disobedient and don't always do what God wants us to do. Isn't that interesting? Well, Jonah also stresses the universal mercy of God towards the disobedient Jews and the cruel Gentiles. We see mercy here in God relenting punishment upon the Assyrians. And there's a generally accepted theme here in Jonah that um, it's a protest against the ultra-national spirit of the Jews, the exclusivism, the narrow-mindedness. God wants Gentiles included in his kingdom. He wants people like you and me, he wants all nations to hear the gospel and be saved. The parable of the Good Samaritan teaches the same principle. You know, joy is an appropriate response when God lavishes grace on sinners. It's not always our first response, is it? Sometimes we act just like Jonah when we see a sinner uh, receiving grace and mercy by the Lord. However, joy is appropriate in those circumstances. When God threatens punishment, he always emphasizes grace, and we are to put no limits on God's grace. What was wrong with Jonah's attitude, do you think? He knew God was forgiving, but he didn't want God to forgive them. He was thankful for his own deliverance, but not for the deliverance of his enemies. God is gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. Jonah knew this, but he forgot his own sin, his own disobedience. He was more worried at one point about a plant than many people. And he cared more at one point about his personal comfort than he did the spiritual destiny of thousands and thousands of people.
Hmm. The book of Jonah ends with a question. Shouldn't God feel sorry for these lost people, even if they are wicked and they need God? Wasn't there a point in our life where we all needed God? We still need God. And can we, unlike Jonah, develop a heart to love the lost? Because that is why Jesus came to this earth, to seek and to save the lost. That's the calling on our life today, is to seek, to save the lost, and to preach the gospel to a lost world. How are you doing with that calling today? How is your heart being cultivated to love the people who need God the most? And how is God working in your life? And how are you allowing God to cooperate, cooperating with Him, to seek and to save those who need Him most of all? I wonder if today could be the day where we live where grace is without limits and that we just give grace to other people as God has so freely given his grace to us. Well, I hope this has been a blessing to you. Don't you just love the story of Jonah and the whale? Tomorrow and the next day, we're going to talk about another very important prophet, Amos, as we continue in the Living Power Online Bible Study. I'm so glad you're here. I can't wait to see you tomorrow. Blessings and shalom.